August 1947. The British are quitting India nearly 200 years after they took power. One of the largest, most ethnically diverse nations in the world has been divided. One country will now become two, India and Pakistan. As a British barrister draws a line on a map, a once peaceful land implodes. People are forced out of the villages they have lived in for generations. 15 million scramble to be on the right side of the new border. At least one million die in the process. And in this huge mass of humanity just moving along, barefooted, no food, thirsty, was a terrible sight, terrible sight. Communities that have lived together for centuries turn on each other in one of the worst communal massacres of the 20th century. It was so senseless, so utterly senseless. And yet, there's nothing you can do about it. Britain, the once great colonial power, looks on as India burns. Hindus and Muslims were in the grip of madness, you know. Lunacy, lunacy. In 1946, British India was largely at peace. On the surface, there was communal harmony between Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs. In the same part of the village, I remember Hindus and Sikhs living side by side, you know, living with us, you know not far from where I lived, you know. And whenever there was any wedding in the family, I remember the Hindus and the Sikhs bringing sweetmeats, you know, to my father, you know, you see, an offering, and we lived very happily, very happily. In British India, the 255 million Hindus were in a majority. India's 92 million Muslims were concentrated in the northwest and northeast of the country. The six million Sikhs lived mostly in the Punjab, one of the richest and most diverse provinces in India. Lahore was its ancient capital. Lahore was one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the country, a center for education and fashion. Rodad Khan, a Muslim, had left his village to study law and history at Lahore's Foreman Christian College. Lahore took my breath away, you know. It was, uh, it was a different city, you know, it, and it was a different world. It was a very liberal, very tolerant, very progressive institution. At the same time, Somanand, a Hindu, was in his final year of school in one of Lahore's fashionable suburbs. The fashions in Lahore became popular all over Punjab, not only in Punjab, but in northern India. There was a famous saying in Punjabi that a person who has not seen Lahore has not been born yet. He has yet to be born. In a few months' time, the peace of this ancient city would be shattered.
For nearly 200 years, Britain ruled over India's 380 million people. India was the centerpiece of Britain's empire, a source of money and power. For the British who were stationed there, life had changed little in decades. John Moores, an officer to a Gurkha regiment, had been in India for a year. We had a hunt, and they'd imported these hounds possibly in the 20s or somewhere like that, and they used to hunt uh, jackal. The tribesmen would come in with a live jackal and um, release them eventually, and then the hunt would take it up and uh, try, try chasing them. But then you had to have a whole brigade out defending the hunters. They would be deployed all around over 70 miles. For decades, Indians had fought to rid themselves of British rule. The independence movement had been kept in check by ruthless military force. But by 1946, everything had changed. World War II had left Britain bankrupt. Mr. Moores and the other British troops knew that they would be the last. We knew that having come through a very expensive uh, world war, that the cost of maintaining uh, an army in India following the, the Far East War, we realised that you know, the goodness couldn't be paid for. The taxpayer, England was in a bad state, particularly 46, 47, financially. But India's independence leaders were divided over what should happen when Britain left. The Indian National Congress, under its leaders Pandit Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi, demanded a single state where all religions would live side by side. But many Muslims feared living under a Hindu majority. Even in the middle-class homes of Lahore, ancient prejudices ran deep. At one level, they were, they had very cordial relations. Our Muslim neighbors were very good. They helped us, we helped them. But see, Hindus had a curious uh, inhibitions. My mother's attitude, she didn't allow any Muslim to enter her kitchen. Any cooked thing from a Muslim home was not allowed to enter the kitchen. When she was eating, she would not allow her uh, Muslim neighbors, the lady, to touch her. So such inhibitions and customs, they, they kept us apart. In Lahore's old city, Muslims were forbidden from drinking from the same taps as Hindus. Zahur Odin, a Muslim, was a champion wrestler from the old city. The Muslims were not getting enough jobs, education, they were not so education. They envied the Hindus who had uh, the best of jobs and they always wanted. That's why uh, the slogan of a Muslim homeland became very popular among the Muslims. Muslim fears that Hindus would dominate an independent India drove the demand for a separate Muslim homeland. It was championed principally by one man, a 70-year-old British-educated barrister, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. 
His Muslim League demanded the division of India into two, one country for the Hindus and Sikhs and another for the Muslims. Once the British leave, and there will be a democratic form of government, you see, you know. But in a democratic form of government, the Hindus will always be in a majority, and the Muslim will always be in a minority. We have no chance. Our minority will never be transformed into a majority, you know. And the Hindu majority will always remain a permanent majority. Therefore, we have no chance. Pandit Nehru, the leader of Congress, toured the country arguing the case for a united India. The whole idea that, that India should be divided uh, was based on a fantastic notion that religion constitutes a nationality. Nayantara Segal lived with her uncle, Pandit Nehru. While I was growing up, the entire national movement, which had cut across religion, region, caste, class, sex, you know, it had been a truly unifying experience. So for a person like me, it was, uh, it was an absurd idea that India should be divided. It made no sense of any kind. Clouds gather over Simla for the opening of Lord Wavell's conference with the Indian leaders. In March 1946, a British government delegation, the Cabinet Mission, arrived to negotiate between Congress and the League. This was supposed to be the breakthrough conference, where a deal would be struck leading to an independent India. Pandit Nehru, who calls for an Indian Republic, is accused by the League of working for domination over the Muslim minority. Jinnah did compromise on his demand for a separate Muslim state. He accepted a united India if it had weak central powers. But Nehru, a socialist and believer in a strong central state, refused any such concessions to the Muslim League. Mr. Jinnah, the Muslim leader, holds fast to Pakistan and it's reported that his maximum concessions were regarded by Congress as inadequate. At any rate, the fateful conference at Simla, following the preliminary work in Delhi, has ended in failure. Calcutta, a stronghold of the Muslim League, August the 16th, 1946. With the collapse of negotiations, Jinnah called for direct action. Thousands of Muslims gathered in the center of the city to demand a separate homeland, Pakistan. As the crowds dispersed, the more radical elements headed for the Hindu parts of the city. I was thinking of going out for a stroll. And then, all of a sudden, I found some Muslim hoodlums. They came out, shouted, nara e takbir Allahu Akbar. Allah is the great master. Local gangsters hijacked the demonstration. They whipped up the mob, and it turned violent. But then I found that a neighbor who had come out to see what was happening, his head was cracked and lay bleeding. So I thought that going out would be absolutely foolhardy. Then these boys, they started hitting the doors and they said that we will not spare any Hindu. As the city erupted in communal violence, Muslim slaughter of Hindus turned to Hindu slaughter of Muslims. Shankar Ghosh 
was covering the riots for a Calcutta newspaper. A jewelry shop was surrounded by a crowd armed with iron rods. An elderly employee, he was already half dead in fear. He came with his folded hands like this. But this furious mob, they had no time to hear what he wanted to say. So I think a boy of 14 or 15 just pulled his leg as he came out and the man fell down and someone hit him on the head with an iron rod. I think that one blow had finished him. Around 5,000 people were killed in three days of rioting. But the British, with one eye on leaving India and fearful of being overrun, ordered the troops to stay in their barracks until it was too late. We had absolute faith in British authority. We had absolute faith in the peace that British had given us. For three days, there was no sign of authority on the streets, and it was anybody could murder anybody. The Calcutta killings shattered the hope of the British that they could get out of India quietly and peacefully. With religious hatred and suspicion growing, the dream of a united India seemed to be falling apart. Pran Chopra was a young reporter for All India Radio at the time of the riots. Until then, there was still the possibility that there could be an undivided India. That impression evaporated in the heat of what, was, what came to be known as the great Calcutta killings. Once that impact spread through the rest of the country, the hope that India could remain undivided began to vanish. After Calcutta, the violence spread. In Bihar, Hindus largely massacred Muslims. In Norkali, in Bengal, it was Hindus who were mostly under attack. With British power waning, India was in danger of falling apart in the chaos of communal violence. One man thought he could bring the country together and maintain the dream of a united India, Mahatma Gandhi. Ashoka Gupta was one of Gandhi's disciples. After the riots, Gandhi's attitude was that we are the same people born in the same country, brought up in the same country. We have believed in the community living. Whether you follow this faith or that faith, it doesn't matter. It's the humanity which concerns. Gandhi spent the first months of 1947 walking through the villages of Norkali, holding prayer meetings, trying to bring Hindus and Muslims together. Ashoka Gupta went with him. Gandhi walked from one village to another, and while he walked, he sang. He rested in a Muslim house, then he rested in a Hindu house. But the great pacifist and campaigner for independence was hardly the unifying figure he wanted to be. Gradually, the prayer meetings, the non-Hindus non were absent. Shankar Ghosh reported the story for his Calcutta newspaper. The Muslims were not keen to come to him, were not keen to listen to him. And before Gandhiji went on his morning 
trip from one village to another, they used to defy the path, spread thorns, bones, etc. on this road. An advance party had to be sent because he was in Noakali, he was not wearing any shoes. He was walking barefoot. Gandhi had always opposed constitutional concessions to Muslims. For many of them, he represented Hindu supremacy. Mr. Gandhi did not appeal to the Muslims, you know. He failed to win the hearts and minds of the Muslims of India, you know. The way he used to talk about politics and his language, his, uh, his, uh, it was foreign. It, it did not appeal to Muslims at all, you know. But he, he used to be practically, you know, naked. He used to have one arm on the shoulder of one girl, and he should have another arm on the shoulder of another. And the Hindus thought he was a saint, you know. Gandhi's dream of a united India seemed to be collapsing. He was a sad man. I think nobody was listening to him. He was considered to be an incorrigible ideal, idealist who has no connection with reality. In February 1947, the British government made a dramatic declaration. They would definitely leave India by June 1948. But there was still no agreement on how to give India to the Indians. With chaos spreading, they decided on a radical solution to appoint a new viceroy. The scene is North Holt Airfield, the occasion the departure of Lord Mountbatten of Burma, who was leaving for India with his wife. Before the new viceroy, there lay the task of holding office for the brief but obviously difficult period of just over a year until the date when Indians are to take full control of India. Everyone in Britain, I'm certain, wishes the Viceroy all possible success in India. I was in school, and they said, you, you'll miss the last term of school, um, and we're taking you out in the middle of this term, because Daddy's been appointed Viceroy of India, and so we're going out for probably a couple of years. And, uh, you know, thought we'd take you as well, because you can be useful. In March 1947, Mountbatten arrived in India. The former Supreme Allied Commander of Southeast Asia had a reputation for being a decisive leader, a man who could knock heads together. His brief was simple, to get a deal and get Britain out before India imploded. The swearing-in, uh, of course, was a, a very great ceremony in the Darbar Hall, and so trumpeters and all the... Uh, staff in their full dress uniform, my father in full dress uniform, my mother in a long white dress, and I think a sort of laurel wreaths in her hair. And they looked like film stars. The Viceroy, his wife Edwina the Vicerine, and their daughter Pamela moved into Viceroy's house in New Delhi with its staff of 5,000. In Viceroy's house, there were indoor gardeners. Now, the indoor gardeners just arranged the flowers and the vases and changed the water. And there were 25 of them as indoor gardeners. There was one man who spent his entire time with a seal that bore the British crown stamping the butter pads. And there was another unfortunate man known as the chicken plucker, who did nothing else. So the scale was so amazing. Narendra Singh Sarila was to become Mountbatten's aide-de-camp, his personal assistant. Among other things, his job was to assist on tiger hunts. 
Lord Mountbatten was a very articulate man and uh, he used to uh, plan ahead what he's going to do and and he used to carry it through ruthlessly. Despite the formalities of life at Viceroy's house, Mountbatten seemed like a new breed of Viceroy. First of all, his background helped him because everybody knew that he was cousin of the king. But still, he was, he acted without any heirs. And I think that impressed Indians because other Viceroy's kept, uh, you know, their sort of upper lip and uh, that sort of thing. And, and I think that helped to impress people. Well, the first thing that was different with my father and mother was that when they were entertaining, I mean, they were in India, they invited Indians, which had never happened before. I mean, yes, of course, Indian princes um, were, were entertained, but the ordinary um, Indian um, ministers and lawyers and doctors or whoever um, had never been invited, so they that was quite a, a new thing. On the personal level, Dickie was a very charming, very handsome, uh, very lovable person who met one uh, very informally. And, you know, when one was very young and rather nervous in front of important people, he could put one at one's ease. He was awfully sweet. Mountbatten's first task was to meet the Indian leaders, Mahatma Gandhi and Pandit Nehru for Congress, and Muhammad Ali Jinnah for the Muslim League. He hoped his more informal style would give him greater success than his stuffier predecessors. They, they, they sat away from the desks in armchairs and uh, were offered refreshments of some kind, and he would... You know, he would say, well, now, before you put me in the picture politically and in the state of India, do tell me a bit about yourself. It was a technique that worked with Nehru. The two would become lifelong friends, but it totally failed with Jinnah. He came out of the meeting afterwards and said to his aides, my goodness, he was cold, cold as ice. <laughs> There were now constant negotiations. As a divided India became a real possibility, the political tensions at the centre filtered down to the local level. The Punjab was worst affected. The province was one of the wealthiest in India. Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs all claimed it as their own. The Punjab was home to most of India's six million Sikhs, the location of their most holy site, the Golden Temple. The Sikhs' great fear was that if India was divided, the Punjab, with its Muslim majority, would end up in Pakistan. For Sikhs, it was unthinkable that they would be ruled by the Muslims, historically their enemies. In many villages of the Punjab, communal harmony began to break down. Aridaman Singh Dillon was living in a mixed Sikh Muslim village. I had Muslim friends and we used to play together. And there was nobody from our families put any obstacles between us. But when the strife began, then I was prohibited from going out with my Muslim friends. But we would sneak away and often we'll get caught and scalded. Uh, my grandfather, he noticed us going about uh, playing around in the fields. We tried to hide, 
but ultimately he found out and I was giving a good thrashing. That's called it. Pai Jassa Singh Ji, Pai Nihal Singh Ji, as a young boy, he watched local politicians stir up divisions between the communities for their own ends. They have to whip up these sentiments of the people. And the easiest way to whip up the sentiments of the people are to tell them that their religion is in danger, that their community is in danger. What else would they tell? To hoodwink people, to get votes out of them, to get support out of them. The people had to be hoodwinked. And politicians do, that, do this. Tension also increased in the Punjab's capital, Lahore. Student Somanand always had a lot of Muslim friends. They now refused to talk to him. A class fellow of mine raised the Congress flag on the school building. The Muslims were very furious. Why? They also raised their, their Muslim League flag on the, uh, on the school building. So the tension increased. The distrust was already there under the surface. It was there for centuries, but now it came above the surface. John Moores and his band of Gurkhas were now sent to Lahore to help the local police keep the peace. We arrived in Lahore around about the 23rd of April. We already knew that there were rumblings going on for intelligence that had been passed to us, and we were briefed on that. And our first job was to um, get to know the city and to how to get around it. We had orders that we were to stay armed and you'd have to go to a dance or have dinner out somewhere with a 845 revolver strapped on because there was already talk about um, people having reprisals. the villages of the Punjab, there were few British patrols. The Sikhs began forming jatas, armed bands. Many Sikhs had served in the British army during the war and still had their weapons. These ex-soldiers began to train their Sikh brothers to prevent a Muslim takeover of the Punjab. Jatadar Shingara Singh had recently been released from prison where he served time for assault. He lived in a Sikh majority part of the Punjab. A number of uh, Muslims from our village had come down to see my grandfather and told him that they have heard rumors that uh, certain people are getting together in adjoining villages to attack our village and other villages to kill the Muslims. Aridaman Singh Dillon came from a long line of Sikh warriors. His ancestors had been imprisoned by the British. His grandfather, the village head, refused to join in the wave of communal violence. A committee of Sikh, Hindu and Muslim people were created and they were given uh, small arms like lances and axes. We had a couple of guns and the basic uh, reason for doing this was to guard their own village 
against the people coming to loot the Muslims of that village and to guard their Muslim friends. And every night they would hold uh, the uh, patrolling uh, throughout the village to guard the village and the Muslims. Seeing the Sikh preparations for war, Muslim villagers decided to launch a first strike. In March 1947, Sikh villages around Ravalpindi came under attack. The charge of the day, Abbe, the Salak, Allah, Wakbar, Yahili, Aka, Allah, Wakbar, Yahili, Nali, you know, the Kuladian, the son, Kuladian, oh, oh, Charles, the son. और बड़े मतलब यानी एग्रेसिव सन बड़े गुस्से विच सन जिसा के सानू खाई जान गए ते साडे वास्ते एक नवी गल सी के सदियां तो असी उथे लोग रह रहे सन के होया की है द सिक्स वर हेवली आउटनंबर्ड बाय मुस्लिम्स द बिगेस्ट फियर वाज दैट देयर वुमेन वुड बी टेकन अवे कन्वर्टेड एंड रेप्ड एक मुसलमान सी गुलाम रसूल उदा ना सी उसने एक लड़की दी डिमांड की थी कि एक लड़की मैंने दे दियो ते असी सारे लोकानु ओ बदमाश टाइप दा आदमी सी और असी सारे लोकानु इतु आटा दे आगे The women of the village went into hiding. Bir Bahadur Singh's father decided to act to save the honor of his village. His teenage son looked on. Ten years to take, forty years to take. These are the Sunakhiyas and Sadia. Like it, many other than Sunakhiyas are there. Some Parda, Nim Parda, like that. They all do first. Ten years to take. आवाज मारी सब दो पहला आपने बेटी नो मान बेटा आजा मेरी पहन मान कोर जिधि 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 मेरे को दो साल बड़ी सी ठारा और उन्नी साल दी सी और बैठ गई मेरे पिताजी ने खंडा जब कर लगे ते वो वार जड़ा सी वो लगे आना वार लगे आना और अब जाने मुंह आ गया और की हो गया मेरी पहन ने अपनी गुत्ते अंक की थी और मेरे पिताजी ने बड़े गुस्से नाल जो तो पट्टा अंक की था और मोरी कृपान और सिर ओ परेशी थी और दो ही चाचा पतिजा ने मेरे एक और ताहजे भी ऊपर सम जिन्हें दा काफी बड़ा शरीर सी उन्हें सारे ने कटना शुरू करता खट 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 दी आवाज़ आम सी मैं जकीन जान के जाना एक सात साल में आई दी याद है किसे ने हाई नहीं की थी बस वाइग्रू दी आवाज़ आम दी रही है किसे ने हाई नहीं की थी कोई नसी ने किसे ने रोला नहीं पाया सच सीन्स वर रिपीटेड थ्रू आउट द वेस्टर्न पंजाब इन मार्च एंड अप्रैल 1947 With the threat of all-out conflict, a deal became a matter of urgency. The Congress leader, Pandit Nehru, now had power within his grasp. But to get the British out quickly, he had to compromise. He abandoned his dream of a united India and accepted partition. A statement will be read to you tonight, giving the final decision of His Majesty's government as to the method by which power will be transferred from British to Indian hands. On the night of June 3rd, 1947, Mountbatten, Jinnah and Nehru broadcast the news that they had finally struck a deal. They would divide India in two. I must also appeal to every community, and particularly to Muslim India, to maintain peace and order. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I, 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 it was like a dream come true, you know. 
mighty forces are at work in the world today and in India. And I have no doubt that we are ushering in a period of greatness for India. I remember I heaved a sigh of relief that there was partition because we did not want to live with the Muslims anymore. But there can be no question of coercing any large areas in which one community has a majority to live against their will under a government in which another community has a majority. The partition deal involved giving those provinces with a Muslim majority to Pakistan and those with a Hindu one to India. But Mountbatten and Nehru insisted that the Punjab and Bengal would be treated differently despite their Muslim majorities. Jinnah was forced to accept that both these provinces would be cut in half and divided between India and Pakistan. The next day, at a press conference, Mountbatten dropped a bombshell. Britain would not be leaving in June 1948, as had been planned, but on August 15, 1947, just three months away. When asked why the date had been brought forward by nearly a year, Mountbatten replied, Why should we wait? Waiting would mean that I should be responsible, ultimately, for law and order. It should have been possible for them to say, that, look, there's no great hurry, don't fix a timetable, let, the, let, it, let it proceed in a more orderly manner. But he was a, a decisive man. This is the job I have to do, this is the date by which I'll do it. This, this was his uh, personality that made uh, the pace of the partition furious, impossible to moderate. It, it was no question of it being too soon. It was much too late, because in fact, when he arrived, he, he saw the situation was so much more volcanic than he'd been led to believe in England. And he had that diary that he had over everybody's desk saying, however many days to independence because it seemed so unbelievable and the next morning you went into your office it was one day less and it, it certainly concentrated people's minds but with three months to go no decision had been made on one crucial matter where the border between pakistan and india would lie a new boundary had to be urgently drawn up the man chosen for the task had never been east of Paris, British barrister Sir Cyril Radcliffe. Cyril Radcliffe was a very remarkable man. It, it was not just the quality of his mind, uh, though that was formidable, perhaps the most formidable I ever encountered, I think. He had this unerring gift for going to the heart of anything he was discussing. He, he came very clearly to a rational conclusion. He was a very rational man. On July 8th, Radcliffe arrived in India. He moved into a bungalow on the Viceroy's estate. With partition only 36 days away, he met Mambatton. The brilliant and serious barrister did not quite hit it off with the flamboyant Viceroy. I think he thought that he was a vain man um, and not a man whose judgment was totally to be relied upon. But he didn't, uh, he didn't dislike him and I think he respected the fact that Mountbatten was the last viceroy and doing the best he could with a very difficult remit. Could you get me the figures please for the Gurdaspur district? Um, I believe I'm right in saying that there is a, a, a narrow Muslim majority, but not a substantial one. Uh, yes, it's 50.6%. 50 With his now private secretary, Christopher Beaumont, Radcliffe began his work. His toughest job would be in the Punjab and Bengal, which were being divided in two. Radcliffe was being asked to draw a line through the middle of both provinces. In doing so, he would look at which religion was in a majority in each individual district, but he would also take into account other factors, such as the connection of railways, canals and irrigation channels. 
In the streets of its great capital, Lahore, there was uncertainty over which side of the city the border would fall. Satish Gujral was an art student in Lahore from a politically influential Hindu family. Most of my Muslim friends also agreed that logically speaking, there was more chance that Lahore will go to Indian side. Because seeing everything belongs to Hindus, educational, money, banks, insurance, buildings. ये जहाँ मौला जी दोहा करना ही देख लाओ सान पाकिस्तान जी लिया ऐसी अच्छी रही है ऐसी को रोमबार ना निकली है और सारियाँ कब्रां भी ऐसे निकल गई हैं जब मरांगे ऐसे को रोमबार ही निकले वो ना के देख गया है ना के देख आया On the quayside at Bombay, Viscount Mountbatten bids beau voyage to 1,500 British soldiers. With tension increasing. The British government decided this was the moment to bring most of the remaining troops home. With just over a month to partition, tension on the streets of Lahore began to turn to violence. There was a date and everybody then knew that do whatever you can now, because after this date you won't be able to do it. Whether it's looting Muslims or looting Hindus, whatever it might be. So therefore, the 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 date itself became a driver. With the border still to be decided, Muslims, Sikhs, and Hindus began to clear their neighborhoods of anyone not of their community. ਮਾਹੌਲ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਖਰਾਬ ਹੋ ਲੱਗਿਆ ਫਿਰ ਇਹੋ ਹੀ ਹੋ ਲੱਗਿਆ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਇੱਥੋਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਮੁੰਡੇ ਸਨ ਨਾ ਉਹ ਰੇੜੀ ਤੇ ਵੱਢ ਕੇ ਨਾ ਵੱਢ ਵੱਢਿਆ ਕਰਕੇ ਇੱਕ ਅੱਧਾ ਬੰਦਾ ਮਿਲ ਗਿਆ ਕੋਈ ਜੋ ਫਸ ਗਿਆ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਵੱਢ ਕੇ ਤੇ ਬੋਰੀ ਪਾ ਕੇ ਤੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਲਿਆ ਗਏ ਉਹ ਗਾ ਸੀ ਉੱਥੇ ਲਿਆ ਕੇ ਤੇ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਸਾਰ ਦੇ ਸਨ ਇਹ ਮੁੰਡੇ ਮੁਸਲਮਾਨ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਐਸੇ ਏਰੀਆ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਮੁਸਲਮਾਨ ਹੈ ਸਾਂ Despite violence erupting around the Punjab, the British presence was now minimal. John Moores and his small group of Gurkhas did what they could in Lahore. You tried to get in there quickly and say, well, what's happened with the police? And they say, well, this shop's been set on fire. And then the next thing which, which upped it would be someone would be killed or burnt. Um, and so then you get a reprisal from the other side, then picking on somebody else. And gradually, this is how it escalated. It was like a bush fire. And it was difficult to, to control. As Lahore tore itself apart, Mountbatten had other problems to solve. Partition was just a few weeks away, but the future of large parts of India had yet to be decided, that of the princely states. Ruled by princes, these semi-autonomous states were dotted around India. They had been allowed to run their own affairs in return for their loyalty to the British crown. The princes assumed the British would allow them to decide their own fate after they left. But Mambatan had done a secret deal with Nehru. He would hand most of them over to India. Narendra Singh Sarila, then a young prince, attended the meeting where Mambatan announced their future. In July 47, my father said that the last Chamber of Princes meeting is going to take place in Delhi, in which Mountbatten will address the princes. It is an important meeting. You go, you deputize for me. You know, he was trying to build me up. On July 25th, the princes gathered to hear what Mountbatten was offering them. He 
he came and stood in front on the podium. And uh, I remember that he looked left and right while pictures were taken. It was, it, it was perfect uh, showmanship. And then he started addressing the princes, your highnesses, ladies and gentlemen, and he said that uh, we have no alternative but to sign the instrument accession. Mountbatten told the princes they had little choice. Join the Indian Union or be swept away in a wave of democratic change. And I think this made a great impression. And many of the princes who had these ideas that they would, they would become independent and do what they like, they, they just collapsed. They realized that if they didn't sign, uh, most of the princes, the small ones, they would be most probably wiped out. With the princes in the bag, the partition settlement was nearly complete. All that remained was the final border, down to Sir Cyril Radcliffe. I think it was the loneliness of the decision which uh, I, I remember him talking about. It wasn't a single decision, it was a series of decisions about where the line should be drawn. These decisions were going to be his and he had to take responsibility for them. And I think he found that a lonely experience by comparison with some of the things he'd done. Sir Cyril had no time to see what was happening in the lands he was dissecting. His approach to drawing up the boundary, separating majority Hindu Sikh areas from majority Muslim ones, almost certainly encouraged the religious cleansing of entire districts. There were areas where the margins were not very great. Therefore, the majority in those areas wanted to make sure that the process didn't get fudged with small numbers. So drive those, the minority out, whether it is Hindu or Muslim minority, to make sure that this bit of territory doesn't slip out of your hands. Mayhem now ensued in the villages of the Punjab. A few individuals took a stand. Dylan's grandfather was threatened for trying to protect his Muslim neighbors. Some people had often sent messages to my grandfather that people who were going about looting and killing Muslims, they wanted to eliminate our family because we were putting a obstacle in their way. But my grandfather would not be deterred. He would not be afraid. He was that way. Small contingents of British-led troops scoured the countryside trying to stop the violence. But by then, there were just too few to make a difference. One had messages coming in all the time by hand, written messages. I can remember one, it was a rather sad, pathetic note by some chap who could write a little bit of English. And he had been in the Indian Navy. And on a scrap of paper, this came in one day saying, I, I'm home on leave at this particular village. And 
my name is so-and-so, my number is so-and-so, please can you come and help us, we are going to be attacked. But by the time we located the village, we got there and the village had been attacked and I couldn't find this man, a lot of people were killed. Uh, so it was that sort of message, it was sad, you know, people desperate for help and knew where we were. But when I say we were, we were only a hundred people. I mean, the whole area was something like, what, 40, 40, 50,000 square miles? One village I went into where we knew there was something afoot. I hadn't been told to go there. I was coming back at the end of a patrol and I saw vultures circling and so that was usually a pretty good indicator and um, got into the village and sure enough it had been completely decimated. Uh, the well was full of bodies, women, one woman had been pregnant and she'd been carved open completely and breasts had been cut off and uh, awful, awful atrocities. In Lahore, murder was now an everyday occurrence. With partition just two weeks away, rumours circulated that the city would go to Pakistan. Lahore's richer Hindus took no chances. There was tension. They, uh, the Hindus started leaving much before they partitioned Lahore. They knew that Lahore would go to Pakistan. They started leaving the city, but they pretended that they are not leaving. They kept their drawing rooms as as it were there all the sofas and all this all the furniture was there in the hearts there was a, a, a hope lingered that lahore would be on this side kai jade maare mote san ho jaye utare maar ke bechare lukhe re kithe jaiye kithe aaye oh log hi moye na jade sokhe san Som's father, a bank manager in Lahore, said if they could live under the British, they could live under the Muslims. I didn't want to leave. My father also didn't want to leave. He hoped and he said, okay, all these people who are leaving, they are fools. They'll come back tomorrow. But that was not true. When our neighbors started leaving one by one, he still hoped. Uh, our closest neighbors, who we had very close relationship, the Bhatias, when they left, my father wept that day. As thousands fled, Muslim gangs set fire to the Sikh and Hindu areas of the old city. The old Lahore, beautiful and historic, was in flames. At night when I used to sleep on the terrace, I could see the Hindu Shahalmi area burning five miles away. The flames could be seen. So high the flames were, Shahalmi was a thickly populated Hindu area. It was burned down completely. And I could see five miles away the flames, the light, all that. And we were so terrified that night. All around my house, people were running, children, elders, women. When I asked someone, he said, mobs are coming. 
and the area is on fire. He told me to run at once if you want to save your life. The whole horizon, full of fire, smokes, and all red. It was such a sad, sad, sad uh, moment for my life, seeing Lahore, just such a beautiful city. It was all burning. I have done what I can in drawing the line to eliminate any avoidable cutting of railway communications and of river systems, which are... On August 9th, Radcliffe had finished drawing up the border. But Mountbatten decided to keep the new boundary a secret until after independence, so the British wouldn't be blamed for any ensuing violence. The delay prolonged the uncertainty, and some believe it increased the loss of life. Signed, Cyril Radcliffe. I never forgave him. Why he kept the decision to be announced about Lahore so late? I feel much killing would have been saved if they had announced the fate of Lahore 15 days before. On the eve of independence, Radcliffe wrote to his stepson in London. Nobody in India will love me for my award about the Punjab and Bengal, and there will be roughly 80 million people with a grievance who will begin looking for me. I do not want them to find me. I've worked and traveled and sweated. Oh, how I have sweated the whole time. Radcliffe left India four days later, never to return. He was deeply conscious that his rulings or his recommendations his, would generate controversy, conflict, and the possibility of a, loss, a loss of a lot of human life. Um, I do remember him saying that any solution, any drawing of the line would have done that. On August 14th, 1947, a new country was born on the subcontinent. Jinnah's dream of a Muslim homeland became a reality in Pakistan. Through Karachi's streets drives the Qadi Azam, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Pakistan's first governor general. It's Karachi's first day of independence, and the crowds are out to greet him and Earl Mountbatten. Mountbatten was in Karachi to declare independence for the newly created state. Bazali, no one except he and Radcliffe knew where its borders were, but this didn't stop the celebrations. It never occurred to us that the Muslims of India will ever see the emergence of his sovereign, independent country, you know, which they could call their own, you see. A country they could live for, a country they could die for, you see. You know. It never occurred to us, you know. The next day, it was the turn of India to celebrate. Hundreds of thousands thronged the streets as Nehru, Mountbatten, his wife Edwina, and their daughter Pamela made their way to the constituent assembly. Unfortunately, when my parents arrive, they can't get in because the crowd is so thick, but so thick, that they can't open the doors. So there's no way for them to get in. So somebody has to crawl in some window and, and go to the prime minister and say, it's like the, to the vice right, I can't get in because the crowd is so vast. Will you come and sort it out? So now we had to sort of scuttle around the back and start hitting people and shouting at people and clearing away, which he was always brilliant at and loved doing. And eventually my parents were allowed to 
make their state entrance considerably less um, dignified than, than had been expected. Well, you must remember that whatever the tragedy of partition, there are other aspects to it, and it was an exhilarating occasion. And there were you know, millions of people out on the street celebrating. Uh, for my uncle and for his colleagues, it was the realization, though not in whole but in part, uh, of uh, their lifelong dream, the cause to which they had given their entire lives. And here it was. Indian independence. But not everyone was celebrating. Gandhi, who for decades had struggled for a united independent India, lay fasting in Calcutta. His disciple Ashoka Gupta was with him. He was a disappointed man. He was a man in distress. And he found that whoever people went with him to start with now are deserting him. The desertion by other leaders, I think, hurt him very much. He wanted to die. His attitude was, let me die. With the celebrations over, Mountbatten finally announced the new border. It sliced through the previously united provinces of Bengal and Punjab. Lahore was given to Pakistan, a disaster for the city's few remaining Hindus. We were dejected and we were so sorry. Because see, those Hindus, by that time, Hindus had realized that it would not be possible for them to stay in Pakistan. Millions of people were now on the move. Muslims who found themselves on the Indian side of the border and Hindus and Sikhs who were on the Pakistani side. They packed their belongings onto bullock carts and left the villages they had lived in for generations. The refugees formed human caravans, called kafilas. The lucky ones had military escorts to protect them from armed bands waiting on the roads. The first major refugee movement, the biggest concentration, was about a 50 miles long column of over uh, 200,000 people was moved, and I was escorting it from Jalandhar onwards up to the Pakistan border. Wajahat Hussain was a young army officer. He had been sent to the Punjab to deal with disturbances on the border. We had very few troops with us, very few troops with us. So here were these people. There were no transport arrangements. There were no arrangements for the medical cover. There was nothing except that we had collected these people in open spaces. They were told to move, and they were moving on foot. Some had bullock carts, and they put their belongings on the bullock carts, and their old people and children. Others were on the foot. And we used to do about, in the, initially, we used to do about 15 to 20 miles in a day. But as they got tired, as the days passed by, they became less and less. 
ਪਾਣੀ ਗੰਦੇ ਪੀਤੇ ਪਤਾ ਨਾ ਆਈ ਤਾਂ ਬੁਕਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਅੱਜ ਹੋਣੇ ਲੱਗੇ ਝੋਨੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਇਆ ਕਰਕੇ ਤੇ ਪਾਣੀ ਪੀਣਾ throughout august and september the columns of refugees grew and grew from hundreds of thousands to millions will you imagine 2 million people on one road virtually and it's just a seething mass of people trying to get water trying to call in wells were poisoned um trying to find food trying to cope trying to cook women having children and it's awful awful things And of course they often try to stop us and to ask for help and sometimes if depending on what we were doing we'd stop and say what's the matter what do you want and then they they'd say we know we've no food and say well, I'm sorry I can't I can't do anything for you because that wasn't our job we just didn't have any food to give them First they used to start uh, throwing their baggage which they were carrying, everybody, whatever little they had to carry. And after three, four days, they used to gradually drop. And then they were left with just the clothes, shattered, tattered. And lastly, the mothers leaving their small babies. That was our biggest problem. And there were these crawling babies and on the side of the road with these thousands and thousands of people just moving it was a terrible sight terrible sight tens of thousands of people boarded special refugee trains that made their way between india and pakistan they were easy prey for the armed gangs that roamed the countryside. It was John Moore's job to escort a trainload of Muslim refugees to Pakistan. It wasn't a train, it was just a lot of coal wagons, steel coal wagons, and this of course is August, which is pretty hot. And we loaded up these these wretched refugees. It was very distressing, and the journey from Ambala to to Amritsar by train normally would you, you could do it in about, I suppose, four five hours, and um, in this case it took four days. There was no water, very little water on the way. We had our own supplies of water for the three platoons, um, but we had a job to do, and uh, we couldn't help it, help them. Three days into their journey, they reached the Sikh stronghold of Amritsar. Just 14 miles from the border, they were forced to stop to pick up water. The station had been taken over by hundreds of armed Sikhs. Amritsar station was crawling with, it was packed, it was like sardines, uh, right across not just the platforms, but across the tracks. They all had weapons of some sort or another. Some were old blunderbusses, some were fairly modern rifles, spears, swords. They were shoulder to shoulder crowds and pushing and shouting and screaming. And um, you realized that you were just going into a hell. And if you didn't look tough, 
it was they were, you were you were for trouble because they, they would then have gone for us before the refugees. And um, I said the thing to do is um, to get the grenades out, let them see. A lot of them are ex-soldiers. These people here, the weapons they were carrying. Let them see you priming grenades. Prime the grenades, and that they'll know you mean business then. And doing that, they, the crowd sort of melted back and away and left us clear. And I suppose we must have been in the station for about oh, four hours, something like that. And just as dawn was breaking, we managed to, to pull away the engine to do the last 14 miles. There had been very little planning for the movement of refugees or their protection. Most British troops had already been sent home, whilst Indian and Pakistani forces were in total disarray. They were totally inadequate forces. And the reason was very simple, because the Indian army was being split. At the same time, don't forget that the, the troops were also concerned about their families because wherever they came from, the trouble was going on in their homes also. So they were very much concerned. And most of them were on leave, or they were on the process of joining their new unit, or they had already joined. So very much, very few bodies on the ground, really speaking, available to us to deal with the job. Most trains had no military escorts with inevitable consequences. John Moores was called to Umbala station to meet a train that had been attacked. This was a train load of, I don't know, five, six hundred, seven hundred people, most of whom had been killed, slaughtered, um, mainly elderly um, people, young children, young women, and they had been attacked and slaughtered, shot, I can remember seeing a young woman with her, she was still alive, her head open, cut open, and her, you could see her brains, and knew there was nothing that we could do. We hadn't got any surgical facilities or anything like that, but it was, it was a horrendous, horrendous thing. Um, and I still think about it very much. Art student Satish Gujral helped organize the transportation of refugees. In Amritsar, he saw the hatred Partition had brought. The Muslim girls' school nearby had been raided, and all these girls had been brought out, stripped, then taken in procession to this this location, where they were being systematically raped. I have recalled in my life story that man watching it. I looked at the face of those others who were attending it in search of compassion. I found none. In the coming months, around 15 million people made the journey from one side to the other. At least one million were dead. Thousands more lay abandoned in makeshift refugee camps, stuck on the wrong side of the border. The Viceroy now led the relief effort. My mother was forever visiting the, the Punjab. She visited in five months. She did 70 major tours of the Punjab uh, into the camps and trying to organize, organize the camps, organize the hospitals, get guards on the hospitals, um, get food. And they soon learned that tell Lady Mount Batten something or answer one of her questions and something will happen. Pandit Nehru, the new Prime Minister of India, toured some of the camps with her. Finally, he came face to face with the price his people had paid for partition. 
Satish Gudra was in a refugee camp in Lahore when he arrived. I vividly recall everything graphically. There the refugees wanted to kill him. He was shocked. A man who grew up as the darling of the people was, was going to be killed by the same people. I had been in pro Nehru fellow, but that evening I did not feel because I thought for the leaders having been truly responsible for all this havoc. Hmm? So I thought he was only harvesting what he had sold. Hmm? So that the first time that day, I felt no reverence toward him. In Lahore, there were now few Hindus left. Somanand and his father were among the last. In the weeks following partition, they came under attack from Muslim gangs seeking a religiously pure Lahore. And it was free for all in the city. There was no one to check them. So they had come for that purpose and somebody had given them our address and all that. And they came to kill us. And to, but fortunately, we had a very narrow escape. And I was with a neighbor, with a Muslim neighbor, and, and they looted, they ransacked the house, took away all the, uh, all the clothes which they could use, all our shoes. And uh, when our Muslim neighbor raised, uh, he raised a hue and cry, uh, they said, we'll shoot you if, you if you support the Kafirs. It was too much even for Som and his father, who throughout the violence had held out the hope that they could stay on in the city of their birth. Then we decided to go to Delhi straight away. Went to the airport and came to Delhi with our two clothes, no, nothing. We left in a plane. My father bought two tickets for Delhi. I saw the our houses when the plane went up and flied over uh, um, Model Town. I wept. In Dylan's village, where the Muslims had been protected by his grandfather, the Indian army arrived one day and ordered the Muslims out. It was a sort of very heavy moment. There were tearful uh, departures and farewells. The Muslims left most of their assets and properties with their neighbors, thinking that they would be able to come again to pick those things up. Initially, the people felt very remorse about their going, but then in a couple of days, sort of, they, they try to occupy their homes. They, they try to take away whatever they had left. In only a few months, India had been divided along religious lines. The Indian part of the Punjab was cleared of nearly all its Muslims, while Pakistan was emptied of most of its Sikhs and Hindus. Lahore, once one of the most mixed cities in all of India, was now home only to Muslims. Gone was the cosmopolitan Lahore. You see. Gone was liberal, tolerant, progressive Lahore, you see. But I think culturally, Lahore suffered. You see. It was a great city in those days. It was a great city in those days. With the passage of time, we became more conservative, more uh, backward, more intolerant, more pseudo-Islamic, you know. Pseudo-Islamic, I think the 
primary responsibility is of the Hindus who didn't treat the Muslims as their equals. That was the root cause. The Muslims and Hindus couldn't integrate despite living together for all these centuries. With the partition over, the job was done for the few British troops still left in India. John Moores returned to Britain at the end of 1947. I think the worst thing was that we couldn't stop the violence. It's the un unnecessary cruelty is something which we didn't really know much about. Mount Batten stayed on in India until the end of 1948 as its Governor General. He returned to his career in the Navy, becoming first Sea Lord. He was killed by an IRA bomb in 1979. The whole problem was that Mountbatten tried to do this job in too short a time. To expect a country to be partitioned, a new country to be created, and within two months, move the portion of the uh, government of India to Pakistan and to move the troops to Pakistan and from Pakistan to India was a tremendous job. It cannot be done, in, and that's exactly what happened. Everything went out of control. Satish Gujra, the art student from Lahore, became one of India's greatest painters. This experience sank in me so deep after partition and began to paint without any consciously of it. This woman suffering, this brutality of man to man became my theme. The border created in 1947 would become the focus for three wars and 60 years of animosity between the government of India and Pakistan. But for the people of the two countries, it was the tragedy of separation that lingered on. I miss my friends. I couldn't understand why they had to go. Why were they pushed away? The only thing was that they were being pushed away. I knew they were not going happily, so I couldn't understand why. And I still think, why? What did they anybody get out of it? BBC Four at 11 in Midnight's Grandchildren, three British teenagers travel to the Punjab to see how their families were affected by partition. Coming next here on BBC Two, Newsnight. <laughs>